Hi everyone, welcome to another video. So today I wanted to get into um, this whole chart solution thing in a little bit more detail. Specifically, I want to address the question of why it works and it does work and why I still don't recommend it. So instead of making a sort of long lecture kind of video, I thought we'd do another reaction. I haven't really seen this one in detail. Um, hopefully he's going to explain what it is and I'll stop it and explain why I agree with him sometimes and disagree with him a lot of the time. Okay, let's go. The McDougall diet is based on starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables. The McDougall program avoids all animal products and all free oils. That's okay, so in other words, it's a low-fat vegan diet. Now, if you look at his videos, you look at his other lectures, he says he's basing this on a lot of traditional diets, including the Aztecs and the Mayas. You can go and you can research the Aztec traditional, what we know about the traditional Aztec diet, what we know about the traditional Incan diet. Um, not sure if he talks about the Mayans, but the Aztecs and the Incan, sorry, I may have misspoke there. Um, and you'll see that, yes, those diets do include a lot of grain. Um, they also include a lot of fish, um, meat. Uh, in the case of the Incas, it was camel meat, uh, llamas and alpacas and so on. So these were not vegan diets, which is what he's advocating, right? So just to, off the bat, um, what he advocates, if you look at the gap between what he advocates and you look at the data for what he advocates in terms of historical populations, there's a massive gap there, okay? It's a program. Starch-based diet. What are starches? Starches are rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, breads and pastas. There are thousands of different starches out there. Some of you... <laughs> there certainly are thousands of different starches if you're going to get to varieties and so on. Um, many of them cannot be consumed or if they're consumed, they have to be heavily processed. Um, if you look at the cyanide content of certain tubers and so on um, that have been consumed traditionally in Africa, for example, um, that needs to be it needs to go through a process before it's even human edible. Um, so yeah, so this would these are by and large these are foods that humans have only consumed in the last ten thousand years. If they were consumed prior to ten thousand years ago, and there is some evidence that he has pointed to in some of his writings, I don't know if he's going to talk about it here. But you look at those societies that were eating some starch and tubers 50,000, 70,000 years ago. First of all, they were very, you know, it's one culture out of many, many, many that may be eating that, right? And secondly, when you dig deeper, you find out that this culture was going through a period of starvation. Maybe they didn't survive most of the time. Certainly, had, they had really bad dentition, really bad teeth, which is a sign of malnutrition. So uh, keep all this in mind. Used today, many of you used in the past. As a matter of fact, all large successful populations of people have obtained the bulk of their calories through from starch. Depends what you mean by large, depends what you mean by successful. Um, so if we look at human history, what we find is that there is a certain time in human history when um, kings and sort of warriors wanted to enslave lots of people, wanted people to work for them for practically nothing. And in order for that system to work, you had to feed them grains and starches, right? Um, in the beginning, of course, later on, this became food for kings as well. But in the beginning, at least in my understanding of this history, this is literally food for slaves, cheap food to keep them active and healthy up until a certain point. Not healthy enough that they could rebel, but healthy enough that they could work for you. Um, that has been the historic role of starches. In He's mentioned big cities. It's absolutely correct. Because if you look at advanced civilizations that abandoned big cities, for example, in North America, those did not rely on grain so much. They relied more on animal foods. Throughout all of verifiable human history, there's only been a, a few people who've lived on the extremes of the environment that have followed otherwise, like the Inuit Eskimo, because of their environment, their frigid environment. You know, they've got to eat mammals and fish. That's all that's available. Or there are a few tribes in Africa and in South America that have decided what they're going to do is they're going to go on a diet that's heavy in meat and milk. But, but... So, so the traditional human diet was heavy on meat. Milk is later. Milk is a much later um, innovation, if you like. Um, but the tradition, the oldest human and pre-human hominin populations we know of were eating a lot of animal foods, especially um, elephant foods, right? So when he's talking about the... Um, people in, in the far north, the Inuit people and so on, those are the people, in my opinion, and, and from what I can make of human history, who are eating the closest to a traditional human diet. The traditional human diet would have been things like um, giant mammals. Um, there's a term for those giant mammals that is escaping me right now. But, you know, there's massive megafauna. That's the term I'm looking for. Massive precursors to the cow, 
massive elephants, mastodons, mammoths, and so on. So, um, and those big animals, by the way, they had a big quantity of fat. So when those animals went extinct, for reasons we don't have to get into, some people think it was humans uh, that helped them to go extinct, which may be true, may not be true, I'm not sure. But um, regardless of that, when we look at the kind of foods that uh, native peoples in the Arctic are eating, massive, you know, you have elk, uh, maybe you have some, um, some other land animals, um, beavers as well. But if you look especially at whale meat and the composition of, of whale uh, fat to protein, that seems to mimic pretty well uh, what our ancestors who were hunting megafauna, what they would have been eating. So um, in my opinion, what he's describing as, an, as a sort of a, a starvation diet is how he's describing it almost. Like these people had no choice. Poor people that had to eat um, mammals and so on. That's about as close to the traditional human diet um, as any other culture I can think of. You know, we're talking about a few thousand people. That's it. Otherwise... So, so again, at the moment or even for the past, um, you know, since the colonial era, their numbers may have been limited. It's true. Um, but uh, that's not the point. <laughs> the size of the population is not the point. The question is, what did humans evolve to eat? And the animal, and the answer is animal fats and proteins, almost without a doubt, right? I mean, yeah, th there's really very little evidence that would say anything other than that. The uh, 100 billion people who've walked on this planet have lived on various starches with the addition of fruits and vegetables. It's only been in the last 50 years. So again, this is like a straw man. Like, it's not the size of the population that matters here. You can have... For example, if I'm a prison guard and I'm eating, you know, whatever, my steak and potatoes every day, and I'm feeding my prisoners gruel, so there's a hundred prisoners or there's a thousand prisoners to me, does that mean that the, the gruel is the proper human diet? Like his, his logic here is not making much sense. 150 years that we've seen a change in mass from just a very few people eating rich foods to a planet now today in 2023 where half the world's population eats like Americans, like kings and queens. You know, they eat other than starch-based so, diet. So I think where we agree is that the standard U.S. diet, the standard American diet, the standard diet, whatever you want to call it, is complete crap. I think we agree on that. I think the reasons are not clear. So when we look at traditional diets all over the world, they always included animal foods. Even the ones that he's talking about, as I mentioned at the beginning, they always included some animal foods. And that was actually a very important part. And if you go and you look at those anthropological surveys, for example, of the nearly vegan uh, Mexican tribes that some of the vegans like to trot, like to sort of trot out when you have a debate with them. You look at the actual anthropolog anthropological surveys and you see what those people were saying about themselves and their diet, and you find out they're not happy. Why are they not happy? Well, they can't get enough meat, right? What does that tell you? I ate a meal plan designed around animal foods. What's for dinner? Turkey. What's for dinner? Steaks. What's for dinner? You know, cheese souffle, whatever. Uh, that's the way we think of things. Whereas what we should do is having people say, what's for dinner? Beans. That's what, that's what they said in Central America and in Mexico for, you know. So prior to the advent of fire, so the widespread usage of fire, we're talking about half a million years ago. I think most people would put the date a little bit even after that. So, you know, we're talking 100,000 years ago, maybe 200,000 years ago, somewhere around there. Prior to that, like beans were not an option. These are highly toxic. If you eat some small number of fava beans, uncooked fava beans, something like four or 10, you can get sick enough to die, right? So um, no, beans are not traditional human food. They're a very recent food, uh, evolutionary. In, speaking in terms of human evolution, they are a very recent food. Oh, thousands of years. These are the people that are known as the people of the corn, the Aztecs and the Mayans. They live in that corn. You know, look at other populations like the Incas in, in South America who live in the Andes. You know, they have somewhere between 400 and 600 different species of potatoes. They live on potatoes. What's for dinner? Potatoes. But that's not the only thing they were eating, right? They were eating, as I mentioned, llamas, alpacas, different kinds of fish, um, mountainous, you know, in, in these mountainous lakes, in the Andes regions, you have all these kind of fresh, fresh fish, which are very commonly eaten. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to stick with the diet that he's recommending based on those populations, you cannot skip the animal protein. Like That is not an option, right? How about in the breadbasket of the world? What do, you, what do you think is answered to the call for dinner in the breadbasket of the world? I would guess pastas and breads, wouldn't you? And how about in Asia? What, what, when... Pastas and breads, what, I mean, wheat cultivation is a very recent phenomenon in human history. Like it's not, if you talk about tubers, yes, there's arguments for tubers going back tens of thousands of years, perhaps, right? 
starvation foods, but maybe even more than that. Like if you go and visit traditional um, communities in Africa, some traditional communities in Africa today, they know how to dig tubers out of the ground. They know how to cook them properly, roast them, whatever it is. They don't really eat them so much as like suck on them and like spit out the fibers and stuff. But but it's still, um, you can you can argue that tubers are a traditional human food. You cannot argue that wheat is a traditional human food. Like that's totally, that's bizarre. When the family asks, okay, mom, what's for dinner? Or dad, what's for dinner? What do they answer? A starch. You know, so, so they only answer that when they're near f starvation conditions. Even in these um, in these systems that they're talking about, um, like if we look at ancient Egypt, for example, they were they were the original breadbasket of the world, right? They still produce a hell of a lot of wheat over in Egypt. Wheat is still a very important crop, um, but it is it is seen as um, if, if, for example, you go to the house of a traditional Egyptian person and they just feed you bread, like that's not food, right? They will feed you meat, um, especially if you're a, an important guest, if you're someone they want to honor, they're going to give you the high value food. The high value food is meat. Until 1980, this is well documented, up until 1980, 90% of the diet of populations in Asia, particularly the Chinese have been studied thoroughly. 90% of their food came from rice. It's the human diet, a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. So again, you're talking about a period of time when China had been ravaged from World War II, from the Cultural Revolution, from other things that were going wrong. Poverty rates were quite high, um, both whether you measure them in dollars or just in terms of access to resources. So what they ate you know, when they couldn't afford anything is rice. That's true. I completely agree with that. Um, was that good for them? Um, did anyone enjoy that? Do people enjoy living in poverty? I don't think so. Of course, they make the best with it. I don't want to. I don't want to insult people. Some people have a. You have a culture of poverty. You have a culture that sort of comes up around these foods, and you make the best you can. Make you make do the best you can with those foods. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, um, but and as we see, as China is becoming more affluent, when people have a choice, they choose to eat a more diverse diet. Or, or people get fooled. Is they get fooled because the human being is a survivor. You know, we could put up with two packs of cigarettes a day, a third of a bottle of whiskey every day. I agree completely. Or, you know, 200 grams of carbohydrates a day, which is a, not the best idea in my opinion, right? So I completely agree that the human body is quite resilient, especially people like this guy, um, McDougall and, and other vegans who had a diverse diet and had enough animal protein in the first 20 years of their life and then went on a vegan diet, I think they can do quite well, right? And uh, live on a diet of uh, hot dogs wrapped in bacon and cheese. It's, it's amazing what this body is, and we get fooled. Didn't kill me today. <laughs> Maybe I'll have another cigarette tomorrow. Didn't kill me last week. I'll have another drink today. Yeah, it didn't kill me today. I'll have another cup of rice tomorrow. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it hasn't killed me uh, since my last birthday. Well, maybe I'll have another cheeseburger. You know, dripped in bacon juice. You, know, you think you get full. If, if these particular habits uh, killed you right away, you'd never do it. All right. One puff of a cigarette, you end so up. These are not habits. So, so the, the, the starch thing, maybe that's an addiction. I'll leave that aside for now. But eating meat is the oldest human practice. It's what makes us human. We weren't, we weren't humans before we ate meat, right? Um, the oldest evidence we have is that humans may have been scavengers, pre-human hominins may have diverged from their sort of tree-dwelling um, cousins because of their tendency to scavenge meat and especially fat, right? So um, you can't compare that to an addiction. Up on a respirator, no, I don't smoke a drink and you end up uh, falling down and killing yourself. You'd, that's the last drink you'd have. But it takes it takes decades to kill you from, from the wrong food, from food. It takes decades to kill you from starch poison, which is what I call, I call it food poisoning, which has been one of the really uh, important changes in the way I communicate this, this message. I'll tell you, there have been a couple of basic changes. One is I've tried to define it so everybody can understand it. And so I've talked about in terms of food poisoning. The two categories of food poison are animal products. In other words, any from an animal, a secretion, a part of their body, etc. So what animal product products is toxic? The thing that bugs me about this is that the plant foods that he recommends are literally toxic. Like I've talked about beans, we can talk about anti-nutrients and other things, oxalates, etc. I'm not saying that one of those will kill you, but in a high enough dose, like it, it's poisonous, right? Um, so those are literal toxins. Whereas 
meat, like what's, what's toxic in meat? Most animal foods, yes, of course, there may be some exotic meats, snakes and things that you should probably stick away from, blowfish liver or whatever it is that have uh, literal toxins in them that, that may kill you. That is true. But there's nothing in meat that is toxic in the way that something like even oxalic acid or even lectins, right, the, or, or phytates, right? These are known anti-nutrients that can be toxic to the human body, that are toxic to the human body, and that the body has to package and, and sort of excrete, right? So there's nothing, the, the, there's no equivalent in, in, in animal foods. In fact, animal foods are, um, dairy is a little bit controversial, right? So let's stick to meat. Um, meat is just, and there's nothing in meat that's toxic. I, mean, I suppose anything is toxic in high doses, <laughs> but if you're, if you're not injecting stuff into the bloodstream, if you're just eating it naturally in quantities that you can, there's nothing that's even remotely toxic in meat. Animal is uh, a food poison. And the other thing is free oils are food poisons. And then you say to yourself, well, what's left to eat? I mean, that's all I eat. There's nothing else to eat. What's left to eat is starch, just like we talked about. Starch is the addition of fruits and vegetables. So I've tried. So the free oil thing, he's kind of glossed over. Um, I, I can put up a study here by one of the guys he, he really idealized. The 1930s, uh, there was a guy called Dr. Kempner who had the rice diet, which was like 90% starch, right? And, and that only works. Um, there's been some great work by Denise Minger, and then there's been a response to that by Dr. Jason Fung. All fantastic stuff on why this starch diet works. Um, I think it has to do with the Randall cycle. I've gone into that a bit with Bart K and others. Um, basically, if you're having fats and carbohydrates at the same time, it's going to increase inflammation. It's going to increase the propensity to gain weight. It's going to cause a lot of problems. Whereas if you have only one of those, if you have only carbohydrates or only fat in a meal, so he's advocating only carbohydrates, that effect is going to be minimized. You're not going to get such a bad effect from that. And you will reduce inflammation, you might lose weight, there might be some good effects. Now there's a bad side to that, which is that it's a diet that's deficient. Like, especially if you're avoiding the fatty acids, those oils, what he's calling oils, what I would say, what, what about proper animal fats? If you're avoiding those fatty acids, you can have serious deficiencies in the long term, right? Uh, but more likely than deficiencies in the fats, which we tend not to see so much, we definitely see protein deficiencies. I think I'm looking at someone who might be suffering from protein deficiency right now. He died um, soon after this video was made, um, uh, you know, and he'd had a fall 10 years before this video was made and he broke several bones, etc. All of these are signs that he may have been deficient in protein. I can't diagnose anything, obviously. Will you have good results on the starch diet, on a starch solution diet? Maybe. Um, but will you eventually run into problems? Almost definitely, right? I mean, again, it depends on how, how much animal foods you consumed as a child and lots of other things. But the protein deficiency is a real thing. I tried to make it simple, again, so people can understand and they can make definite changes. You got to sit around, well, let's see, should, should I, should I uh, skim the milk or should I uh, take the chicken, the skin off the chicken or, uh, you know, if you get into so many silly rules, starch-based diet and avoid the oil, avoid the animals. That's basically what you need to do. So that was one of the uh, paramount things that I uh, came about understanding. The other thing that I came to a conclusion, that's from my professional life as far as, and also my personal life, is that these substances that end up hurting us have an attraction. Otherwise, why would we, why would we do it if it didn't have an attraction? And as a result of it having an attraction. It has an attraction because it's proper human food, like um, not that burger with the bun and stuff and even lettuce, but meat is proper human food. So if you go, in fact, there's another video, maybe I'll, I'll show that here or I'll make another response video to it where a longtime vegetarian um, you know, actor is talking about how he's, his feet sort of led him to a fish and chip shop and he ordered the cod, right? That doesn't happen. Like you, you never hear someone saying, I went to a vegan store and I ordered a Beyond Meat burger because my, I just felt like I really needed to. No one does that. But you hear it from vegans and vegetarians all the time. I, suddenly, I don't know what happened, but I got up and I had to have meat, right? So it's a, it's a natural, we are, we are animals. <laughs> animals know what their food is and they go and they get it no matter what. Sooner or later, their bodies will force them to eat the appropriate food. People have become highly habituated and often addicted to these behaviors. Some people talk about food as an addiction. I think it's a, a, a lot of habit that has been developed, but whatever you want. I think, yeah, I th if we're gonna talk about addic the addictive properties of food, we cannot skip talking about sugar and carbohydrates, right? Because we know the studies that have been done, that sugar lights up the brain exactly like hard drugs, right? And, you know, many people I speak to who suffer from food addiction, the, the addictive foods are not the meats and so on. 
Rather, they are the carbs. They are the, the simple sugars, etc., which this guy, of course, advocates. I call it. I don't care. Certainly, alcohol and heroin and you know tobacco are there. There are definitely addictions. Well, what I, I've come to the conclusion is, is if you really, really want to change, you know, it's fine. You can practice for a while, but you're really expecting to get off those diabetic medications, to get yourself out of heart, heart surgery, give you your best chance of surviving breast cancer, your best chance of getting out of a wheelchair and not suffering from terrible arthritis. When you get to that point, then you must act like other people do in terms of changing their behavior. You're not an exception. In all my years, all my years of practice, the only way I've ever seen people quit smoking is to quit. I've never seen anybody quit by cutting down. Same thing with an alcoholic. You don't switch by, you don't. This is exactly how I feel about carbs. If you want to get over your carb addiction, quit eating them altogether. Um, I, I don't say that, I mean, I have to, I don't say that um, lightly, like it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and sometimes cutting down can be a strategy for getting rid of them, or at least, um, you know, really getting rid of them altogether. Um, but I think I think what he's saying makes sense in the term, especially as it relates to carb addiction. Well, you don't cure your problem by switching to beer and wine. You gotta quit. Heroin, you gotta quit. You know what? It's the same thing with the food for a good share of people. And that is that if, unless they do it 100%, it's too hard to deal with. You open that refrigerator and there's that piece of cheesecake sitting there looking at you. You've got to be in a position to to say no, just say no. Just like Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan, she was first lady. What did she, what did she tell the youth of America? She didn't tell them to, you know, cut down on your cocaine or your heroin or your opiate. <laughs> Nancy Reagan is a really bad person to bring up here. She, yeah, don't listen to Nancy Reagan no matter what you do. You know, it's you didn't tell that, did she? she said, just say no. So, you know, I've made this uh, a goal of people. So, so why, I mean, I, I sort of mentioned Nancy, Nancy Reagan flippant, flippantly. Um, criminalization is not the problem and blaming the victim is not the problem. If someone has an addiction, whether they're addicted to carbs or alcohol or whatever, it's, it's, we can't blame, we shouldn't blame them because it, you know, if we were in their circumstances, we would have exactly the same thing. So it's not about blaming, it's not about criminalization, but it is about, if, for me as a person, if I'm an addict, it is about understanding my own personality, understanding my own body, understanding what works for me and what doesn't. And certainly some drugs drugs um, may play a role. Um, ketamine may play a role in overcoming alcohol addiction, right? Um, or MDMA, right? Some of these things actually play a role. So criminalization is never the answer. But um, if you are addicted to something, it means by definition that you're, you've lost your ability to moderate. So in that sense, I agree with him. But yeah, don't, don't quote Nancy Reagan at me, please. That uh, you know, if you're ready for the the cure, the best you could possibly get, you need to do it 100. percent And then I would say, the 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 third big effort and big big change in my practice is uh, try to educate people. And if I spend you know my rest of my years doing anything, if I stay productive, it'll be becoming a better communicator to more effectively get this. Poor guy. He, this was pretty much towards the end of his career. This is four months ago, so he passed away a couple weeks ago. So. This was right at the end. A life-saving message across to people. Man, I'm getting better at it. Who knows what's going to happen over the next decade or two. So just to wrap this up, why does the starch solution work? There are a couple of potential answers to that. One is that any hugely limited diet, um, so looking again at that work from Dr. Kempner, where he put people on, on a diet of mostly rice, any hugely limited diet works. Even a Twinkies diet works for losing weight and for many other things, number one. Number two, Dr. Kempner literally had to whip his patients in order to keep them compliant. It was very, very, very difficult, okay? So if you want to torture yourself, if you want to, to be whipped in order to ensure your own compliance with the diet that you choose, maybe the starch solution is the diet for you, but it's not, it's not a human-appropriate diet, right? And all of the data, including some of the data that this guy himself was aware of, the societies he's quoting from the societies he's relying on were not vegetarian or vegan societies. Just they were, there's no way. And he himself, if you look through his own newsletters and, and so on, he says that you have to take B12 supplements, you have to take a few other supplements, iron supplements, et cetera, et cetera. If you follow this for more than, I think, three years or something was his take, right? So he knows that it's a nutrient deficient diet. So yeah, don't do it. It doesn't make any sense. If you want to formulate a diet that is largely carbohydrate, but includes some animal protein, you could. I mean, I'm not saying don't do it. You could totally do it. Um, is it going to be particularly palatable? I mean, this is your whole chicken and, and like um, rice or dry rice kind of diet and so on. People lose weight on that because in part because it's not a very palatable diet, you know, lean proteins and, and, and carbohydrates. 
I prefer, um, and I think most people would prefer, to have a diet that is attacking the Randall cycle from the other side. In other words, we don't mix carbs and fats, so we reduce the carbs right down as far as we can go, maybe a pure carnivorous diet or something close to that, at least a ketogenic diet, and we increase the fat intake. That's just something that's going to have to happen when you reduce the carbs, you're going to have to increase the fat. And of course, that has lots of benefits as well. When I started eating a high fat diet, my mental clarity got much better. When I started eating a high fat diet, my skin got much better, right? So um, there's many ways to do this, but the specific diet that he's recommending is among the worst diets that I could possibly think of for humans to eat. So um, there's no there's no redeeming the starch solution. It, it is, along with Dr. McDougall, it is dead and buried, okay? Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one.